In today's presentation, we are unveiling six habits that can detract from your confidence and how to replace them with behaviors that command respect in your interactions. The first habit to tackle is displaying avoidant body language, which includes gestures that can create barriers between you and others, such as lowering your gaze, avoiding eye contact or turning away. Let's illustrate this with a scenario from a recent encounter. Lewis, while a genuinely nice individual, struggles with stuttering and displaying displays nervous body language that inhibits his ability to connect with his date. Confidence is paramount in such situations. Once you've got that down, the rest falls into its place. Strong, assertive body language can significantly enhance your initial impression and garner great respect from others. The good news is there are various ways to project this confidence. For example, watch John Cena and Matthew in this next clip as John talks about his first failed wrestling persona as a robot. They have almost opposite body language, so how do they both project confidence? And just when I said I would kick your ass at the fairgrounds on Sunday, I would rewind it and say it again for you. I would kick your ass at the fairgrounds. <laughs> that didn't work? <laughs> you know. <laughs> While seeming very different, they both follow four body language principles. They smile, keep their heads up to make eye contact, have their shoulders back and take up the space around them if you want an easy mental cue to give yourself when you're talking in a conversation that makes you nervous. Remember these two words, open and expand. Now, if you try to be more open and expansive, you will naturally do countless little things right without thinking about each individually. Such as a bonus, you'll start to feel more confident too. Avoid embodying language about what goes hand in hand with this next bad habit, talking tentatively. Here's an example of it with Christine Stewart talking about her role in Cyborg. There was just so much about her that, um, you know, really only like were, were ever described in like general really uh, dishonest headlines and like then like the girl from Breathless that like yeah. went like this, you know. This is no knock on Kristen. A lot of people struggle with filler words and stuttering and these habits often get worse when you don't know what to say. The solution is simple. Give yourself permission to pause and think before you answer a question or even midway through a sentence. Don't fear silence. Here's a more recent interview with Kristen. Notice the difference in her body language and how she speaks and thinks about how it would change your first impression of her. I'm wondering if you planned to announce that you're engaged on that show or if, it, if he just kind of got it out of you. That's a good question because he is the best interview in town. Everybody knows that. No clue. I would have told him, <laughs> I was gonna say something really inappropriate. I would tell him anything. <laughs> Once you get good at this, your silent moments of thinking can become powerful moments that build anticipation. Listen to Chris Williamson from the Modern Wisdom podcast for a great example of this. Well, one of the things that I've realized is that people that are self-reflective, that rely on cerebral horsepower, that pay attention, that think in a detailed way. The more nuanced that your thinking is, the fewer people are going to be like you, which makes you feel more alone. How do you think people can overcome this? Replacing filler words and stuttering with powerful pauses is something that most people struggle with. Even once you know you should, luckily there's an easy way to quickly improve this. The trick is to record yourself on a video for just three to five minutes a day, asking yourself questions and then answering them on day one. Start with easy questions you know the answers to that require little thought so you can focus fully on removing tentative talking. What do you do? Where are you from? Describe your family. Things like that. Try to speak at your natural speed and put your mental focus on catching the filler words before you say them and replacing them with pauses. Then from day two onwards, slowly move to questions that require more brain power. Like, what is the meaning of life to you? Immediately after each day's recording, watch the video. Within a week, you'll notice reduction of filler words and an increase in confidence pauses. Now we've talked about body language and speaking habit. Let's talk about what to actually say. The first thing you want to avoid when meeting someone is asking the first instinctive question. These are questions everybody asks, especially if the other person is high status in some way, whether they are that's famous, high ranking at your company, or just really attractive. You can bet there are probably some questions that they get asked all the time. 
What's the most mispronounced? Like What's the worst life? pronunciation of your name you've ever heard? What's the worst butchering of it you've ever heard? What's like the weirdest one you've ever heard? If you want to have a great conversation that people remember, focus on asking questions that most people don't ask and that's the other person is excited to answer. You'll know you've done it right if the other person lights up at the question. Can you recall an instance ever a time in which your formal acting training brushed up awkwardly with the realities of being on a Hollywood set? Well, <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Uh, if you aren't sure exactly what to ask to get someone excited about answer, ask if there's something they're proud or, or passionate about. For example, listen to what Sean Evans asked about Camellia about designing her new house. Is there a detail of your home that you're particularly proud to have your fingerprints on? And then is there one that serves as a reminder that marriage is always about compromise? Ooh, really good question. The common mistake is something you might see when you try to put yourself out there and mess it up. That's the retreating after a mess. This is especially common after you make a joke that doesn't land well. Texas has always led the charge. Well, till about like a couple of months ago and then Austin sort of took over. Like, I don't know guys, like Texas was leading the charge. You're still top 25. We gotta work on that stuff because those people have lost their minds. Right? If this is something you have a habit of doing, don't retreat. Instead, joke about the bad joke. You were given an Oscar for Best Actress. You would also get one for being the worst. <laughs> I think I just lost about 20 points on that one. <laughs> If that seems hard, there's an easy way to recover from a bad joke. For example, watch the news anchor bomb a joke with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama walks into a pizza shop. Because a shop, He's a shop. Pizza? Pizza, pizza shop, yes. Yeah, pizza, pizza shop. And says, can you make me one with everything? What's hmm. <laughs> that? What's that? Oh, yes. Now watch how he recovers simply by laughing at himself for how badly the joke was bombed. <laughs> oh, theoretically possible. Oh. oh, I knew that wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed more at the fact that it didn't work. The next mistake will seem like an obvious one and yet it's something you've probably seen a lot throughout your life, injecting an unnecessary brag into conversations. There's a great example of this from the River King video where he tries to apologize for lying about being on steroids. This is a complicated as topic, at least to me it is, because before social media, I was rich and anonymous and after social media, I'm still rich but no longer anonymous and I never expected this kind of exposure. It's totally unnecessary here to say that he's rich. Forcing his wealth into the conversation doesn't do anything to make his apology better or make him seem likable or confident. This seems like an obvious one. So the question is, why do people do it so often? Because most people want to be liked and they are not sure how to make other people like them. So they try to force what they think makes them likable or admirable into the conversation. This isn't to say that it's bad to share what's interesting in your life. You just want it to come up naturally. For example, listen to Jamie Foxx tell the story of how he met Kane West and ended up in his song, Slow Jams. Since then when I met him, bro, he freestyled a rap. I said, yo, they, they say you rap, he freestyled. I said, oh my God, you're the most incredible rapper in the world. And I was trying to get in music at that time, so I would throw parties for a reason, because Puff was so famous with music. I had a studio in my house. And uh, uh, Kanye goes... Uh, Jamie, mentioning that he has an entire music studio in his house doesn't seem like he's bragging because it's relevant to the story he's telling. But be careful here, because if people think you are telling a story just to work a bragging, they still won't like it. If you want to learn more about telling stories and to truly master the art of storytelling, one must recognize the important role that beliefs and identity play in shaping our narratives. Great stories are not merely about events that unfold. They are reflections of storytelling beliefs, values, and identity. When we understand this fundamental truth, we realize that our ability to craft compelling narratives stems 
from the strength of our beliefs and clarity of our identity. By immersing yourself in a billionaire belief program, you can embark on a transformative journey where you not only learn the mechanics of storytelling, but also cultivate powerful beliefs that empower you to weave narratives that resonate deeply with your audience. This program isn't about acquiring skills. It's about embracing a mindset of abundance, success and resilience with me. The very mindset and beliefs shared by the titans of the world will directly be reconstructed for you. Through my Billionaire Belief Program, you'll get insights from the most successful individual honing your storytelling abilities while simultaneously refining your identity by design. You'll discover how to infuse your narratives with authenticity, passion, and purpose, creating stories that captivate, inspire, and drive action. In essence, learning about storytelling isn't about mastering a technique. It's about harnessing the power of beliefs and identity to become. And with the Billionaire Belief Program, you have the opportunity to learn from the best, building billionaire beliefs that propel you towards unprecedented success and fulfillment. Okay, coming back. The next mistake that people make is also something they do so that people will like them more. But it undercuts your own self-esteem and it makes you look like you lack confidence and that's prioritizing being agreeable over being true to yourself. Oh, gang, are you hungry? Uh, I'm fine. Okay, well, uh, we're gonna... We're going to eat, I think. Oh, well, I'll grab food then. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. People do this because they want to avoid conflict or avoid being a burden. Chronically, it's the exact opposite behavior that lets you look confident and attractive and command respect from people around you. And that's speaking truth to power. Being honest, even when you are telling a potentially unpleasant truth to someone you want to like you. Iconic characters like Don Draper and Tommy Shelby are admitted by their fans because they regularly show this kind of confidence. Can't I keep what I have and just build on it? Well, honestly, the unpleasant truth is you don't have anything. Your customers cannot be dependent on anymore. Their lives have changed. Your own protection is failing, Mr. Kimber. Your boys are taking cuts. I want to suggest that from now on, you contract out your racetrack security to the Peaky Blinders. Especially with people that are used to being surrounded by suck-ups and yes-men. See, this can be a powerful habit, but speaking truth to power can be scary. So build this habit. The easiest way is to start small and start becoming aware of your beliefs. Starting today, become aware of your pleasing beliefs and stop telling little white lies even if you think they are harmless. Start being honest about the seemingly little things like why you are late or why you are turning down a social invite. Your confidence is being honest the same way you build a muscle by starting from where you can and then increasing the difficulty slowly and consistently over time. Eventually, you'll find you have the belief and then the confidence to share even the biggest hard roots will become easy. It may not go well every time, but it's the best long-term path to high self-esteem, high respect and strong relationship. If you'd like a specific blueprint for building this type of unshakable, deep-rooted confidence, you may like my three-month program for consultants and business owners where I help them get personality beliefs so they can win more and achieve more. It's a completely done-for-you model where I step-by-step step show you exactly how to build unshakable confidence in ways that are easy, fun, and life-changing. I hope that you decide to join this and apply and get selected once you fill up the application. Either way, I hope this video helped you and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.